Hello, everybody. Um, and my name is Claire Bozak Schroeder, and I'm an associate professor of classics at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Uh, welcome today to this uh, to this wonderful talk. I'm a white person with a round face, short brown hair, and blue eyes. Um, I'm wearing a turquoise shirt um, and sitting against a mostly white background with some with some pillows and so so forth nearby. I use both she and they pronouns, um, and if we get into a Q&A or dialogue, I prefer to be addressed by my first, my, by my first name. Um, as you can see in the chat, we have a live captioner here today, and the stream um, of the captioning will be available in the chat. I'll reshare it if you've joined since it was shared, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and you can access that uh, at the link. I would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that I am on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As part of a land grant institution, I have a particular obligation to recognize the peoples of these lands and the histories of dispossession upon which the university rests. As a humanist, I also recognize that the past is not past and that no field or arena of inquiry is exempt from the responsibility of addressing the legacies of settler colonialism and its contemporary manifestations well beyond acknowledgments such as this. Thus, this statement is also a demonstration of my ongoing commitment to supporting the work of Indigenous scholars and communities so that we are together able to envision what poet Joy Harjo of the Muscogee Creek and Cherokee Nations calls a map to the next world. Thank you for holding me, the Spurlock Museum of World Cultures and the Department of Classics accountable to this commitment. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third and final in a series of talks that accompany an exhibit I curated now on display at the Spurlock Museum of World Cultures called Bodies in Crisis, Death, Disability and Transformation in the Ancient Mediterranean. I've invited experts from around the world to give short accessible presentations on the themes of the exhibit in conversation with UIUC faculty from other disciplines. Thank you to the Spurlock Museum and the Department of Classics for funding this series. Today, our speaker is Hannah Silverblank, a visiting assistant professor of classics at Haverford College. Her research is primarily based in ancient Greek literature and her doctoral thesis at Oxford examined the voice of the monster in Greek poetry. She also works on subjects in classical reception and has recently published chapters on desire in the, in the work of poet Anne Carson and underworlds in the fiction of surrealist Leonora Carrington. Hannah also works in disability studies and co-authored an open access article with Marcella Ward entitled, Why Does Classical Reception Need Disability Studies? Um, this is one of the best pieces in ancient disability studies period, and I recommend everybody read it and assign it. Hannah's interlocutor today is Adam Newman, an assistant professor of religion here at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Adam specializes in Hinduism, the religious and political history of South Asia, Sanskrit literature, Puranas, sacred space and landscape, and religious conceptions of the body. His book in progress is titled Constructing Sacred Space in Mewar, Text, Temple, Temple and Landscape in the 15th Century Ekalinga Mahat, Mahatmaya, sorry, I, I practiced that a few times, but not, not enough. Um, <clears throat> I'm especially eager to hear his perspective on Medusa as someone who works on the Hindu divine feminine. After Hannah's presentation, Adam will have a chance to pose questions and reactions before we open up for a larger conversation. As we go along, feel free to use the chat box to record questions for later. Um, and uh, Hannah, now it's over to you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm going to begin with a self description as well as a screen share. I'm a young white woman with dark hair and dark eyes and I'm presenting Google Slides through my screen. So those of you who would like access to these slides, you should be able to find that as a link in the chat. Uh, I want to thank the curator of this exhibit, Clara Bosak Schroeder for inviting me, the staff of the Spurlock Museum, the classics department at UIUC, my interlocutor, Adam Newman, the cart interpreter and the audience for being here today. It is a pleasure to be with you in this virtual space. A few content notes before we begin. 
This talk contains discussion of physical violence, sexual violence, childbirth, and death. Uh, now, an overview of what you can expect from me in the next 20 minutes before we open things up. The title of my talk is Monstrosity, Motherhood, and Music in the Myth of Medusa, but I could have also called it as Medusa as Art, Artist, and Medium, because I'm planning to discuss the ways in which Medusa's monstrosity situates her simultaneously as art, artist, and medium in Greek and Roman myth. In order to demonstrate the wide range of Medusa's artistic potentiality as a figure, I will introduce some elements of the myth of Medusa, including the transformation of Medusa from a nymph into a gorgon, which is a later uh, version of the story, something that's not in the oldest sources, but shows up around the first century AD. The theme of the danger of seeing the gorgon, Perseus's slaughter of Medusa. So Perseus is that hero who beheads Medusa. Uh, the birth of Medusa's children and the lament song performed by Medusa's sisters in response to her death, which is a lesser known episode. I will conclude this talk with a quick look, very quick at some of the objects in the exhibition and discuss how they relate to and express different aspects of Medusa's mythic associations with art and aesthetic experience. And I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts about these objects as well, if you would like to share them. What I hope to provide in the next hour's conversation with you is an extra layer of interpretation that you can bring to experiencing the Medusa objects and Medusa themed art out in the wild or in this exhibit. Medusa, I want you to think about this idea that Medusa is figured as both a creator and medium whose embodied hideousness is profoundly generative for Greek art, music, theater, and storytelling. And she's generative in a way that troubles the distinctions between art, artist, and audience. Drawing from literary sources, I will illustrate that Medusa's presence in art and culture serves to signify the grotesque entanglement of beauty, horror, metamorphosis and embodiment all at the heart of artistic production and experience. And I also wanna bring our attention to the dangerous power of aestheticized violence in the myth of Medusa. So to start with the danger of seeing, and the slides that I have today include images that have alt text available in the link to the slides. And there's also textual references on these slides that I don't plan to read out loud that I've just put here as offerings for the curious who want to do research later. So don't feel like you need to pay attention to the text on the slides in quotation. The most prevalent theme in various adaptations of the Medusa myth is the danger of seeing or looking. Um, or the idea that Medusa, who's a kind of hideous monster called a Gorgon, is so hideous that one look cast upon her turns the viewer to stone. Medusa's petrifying power implies that to look at something is to be changed by it. The act and process of seeing shapes the seer. In Greek myth, a demigod named Perseus is the hero tasked with beheading the monster, and he has the support of his half-sibling goddess Athena, who gives Perseus a strategy to defeat Medusa. To catch sight of her reflection, rather than seeing her true visage, he can look at her mirrored in his shield or his sword and then behead her. So once Medusa is transformed into a representation, Medusa can be beheld and destroyed, and her decapitated head can then, after her death, be used as a weapon for the hero. In the past 50 years or so, another aspect of the Medusa myth has grown in popularity, which is the interpretation of Medusa as a feminist icon and also as a victim of sexual violence. The ancient mythic basis for this interpretation comes in part from a version of the story first found in Ovid's Metamorphoses, a poem from the first century AD. Ovid writes that Medusa was once a beautiful nymph but when the sea god Neptune raped her in Medusa's, sorry, in Minerva's temple, Minerva is the Roman name for Athena, Minerva expressed her rage at the desecration of her temple by punishing Medusa via a physical metamorphosis. This punishment is offered as the sort of explanation story or the etiology of how Medusa became so hideous, hideous and got a head full of snakes. 
This version of the story has become increasingly meaningful in pop culture adaptations of the Medusa myth in the context of the Me Too movement. An increasing cultural attention to the ongoing nature of trauma caused by sexual violence. Medusa has become a feminist icon in various modern rep representations, including many magic and fantasy themed television shows like Charmed, as well as feminist philosophy like that of Helen Zigzu and Donna Haraway. For those interested in learning more about modern black feminist receptions of the Medusa myth, next week there is a virtual talk by PhD student Amy Hines Scott with the reg registration info and link uh, in my slides. This is called The Silence of the Medusa. So you can hear more about that next week from Amy. With these elements of Medusa's mythic narrative in mind, I now wish to turn our attention to thinking about how the Medusa myth can situate the monster's body as both art and artist, which in death provides a kind of food for the mycelial processes of art making to proliferate. So I wanted to structure this next part of the talk into three organizing categories, Medusa as artist, Medusa as medium, and Medusa as art. But it turns out that these three categories braid themselves together too tightly for tidy separation, like the lively serpents of Medusa's hair. So let us follow these three braided strands, knowing that they are uh, referencing one another constantly and not truly separate categories. And let's see where we end up. So if we start with Medusa as artist, then her primary medium as an artist must be sculpture. In so far as the act of seeing Medusa turns anything that is alive and sees her into stone, she works at the intersection of living tissue, optical perception, and geological material. We might also observe how the Gorgon's head, once it's separed, severed from her body, continues to produce sculpture via petrification for anyone who sees her head turns to stone. This manifests not only for human people, but even for the more than human people in the natural world, which is also subject to the petrifying power of Medusa's head. As the story goes in Ovid's Metamorphoses, Perseus wrapped up Medusa's head in seaweed to make a sort of protective bag for it, and her head turned the seaweed solid. Thus, sea coral was invented, and this was repeated and created by nymphs from Medusa's venomous head. So from this story, I'm proposing Medusa as an oceanic landscape architect, where the ongoing force of her gaze and venom creates coral and thus designs undersea animal and plant ecosystems. So that's Medusa as artist. Medusa's petrifying power and the fact that it works on non-human audiences likens her to the ultimate mythic musician in the Greek mythos, and that's Orpheus, whose music has the power to stop human and non-human audiences alike in rapt listening. As the classicist Dunstan Lowe has discussed, the petrifying gaze of Medusa is similar to the arresting power of Orpheus's music, both Medusa and Orpheus can turn an audience to stone, but they are also both subject to dismemberment and transformation. Medusa is beheaded by Perseus, as I've mentioned, and Orpheus is dismembered by Bacchans, or worshipers of Dionysus, also sometimes called Maenads. Furthermore, the decapitated heads of both Medusa and Orpheus continue to have the power to transfix even after their deaths, through sight and sound respectively. Ovid describes Orpheus's head rolling along in the river after his death, still singing when a water serpent tries to attack it. And that snake is then turned to stone as a punishment by the god Apollo. Similarly, Perseus uses the head, the decapitated head of Medusa, as a petrifying weapon against his enemies, including the sea serpent that besieges Andromeda. So even in death, both Orpheus, the poet, and Medusa, the sculptor, share the power to freeze time and bodies, to produce ongoing death and art, in a way that freezes time and troubles the divides between human, animal, plant, god, and monster. Another way we might consider Medusa as an artist is via her unusual form of motherhood. As the blade of Perseus severs Medusa's head from her body, her corpse actually continues to give unexpected birth to strange creatures. Pegasus, the immortal winged horse, and 
Crisair, a giant man born with a sword in his hand. As an exaggeration of the hybridity implied in all human gestation, I also see Medusa's mode of motherhood as a kind of collage art. The complex hybridity of her body in the act of procreation generates yet more difference and hybridity in the disparate forms of her children. Now let's think about Medusa as medium. I've mentioned how the song of the mythic poet Orpheus continues after his death. Similarly, the soundscape generated by Medusa's death maintains an eerie afterlife in Greek art. In a fifth century Greek lyric poem, Pindar celebrates a winner of a music contest in which the musical victor played an instrument that's called the aulos. The poem, Pythian Ode 12, provides a mythical backstory to the creation of that instrument, which takes place immediately after the death of Medusa. Before we discuss the musical consequences of Medusa's death though, let's first turn to an image of an artifact that I found is in the Spurlock Museum, or at least uh, I think so, from the website. Um, and this will help us set the scene of Medusa's death. The image on my screen is a Sicilian limestone frieze from the sixth century BC, which features four figures, three of whom are gazing directly at the viewer. From left to right, we see Athena, Perseus, Pegasus, and Medusa. Athena gazes at the viewer and stands just behind Perseus, who is smiling and slicing the neck of Medusa with his sword. Medusa is depicted with the largest head of anyone in the image, grimacing with her tongue out and tusks showing. Her hair is braided and her posture is a lunge, while her arms seem to be catching the winged horse Pegasus, who, according to myth, was born from the wound in her neck, along with his brother, Crisair. Immediately after birth, Pegasus flies up to Mount Olympus to serve the god Zeus, according to Hesiod's Theogony, and he serves as the carrier of Zeus's thunderbolts. So this image shows us the moment of Medusa's death, the creative power of her death in the birth of Pegasus, and this image is fittingly depicted in stone, freezing the death of Medusa in the moment of its occurrence and the monster's fecundity amidst horror and bloodshed. If Medusa continues to give birth after her death, so too does her death continue to produce new possibilities for artistic expression. After she is killed, her Gorgon sisters, who are themselves immortal, lament her death in a song. And here on the screen, I have an excerpt from Pindar's Pythian 12, which is translated by William Race. Um, and I won't read the whole passage. Um, and there's more going on in this poem that, than I could parse in our time together. But what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that the death and dismemberment of Medusa is not only a part of a heroic quest for Perseus, but also a familial loss for the Gorgons. So this poem is talking about a dirge that the Gorgons perform at Medusa's death which marks the monster herself as breathable and cared for within monstrous kin and community. Crucially, this song that marks the loss of Medusa's life goes on to become a significant part of Greek acoustic culture. The Gorgon lament inspires Athena to translate its sound into a kind of acoustic sculpture when she makes an instrument called the aulos or the reeded double pipes. The song Athena plays on these pipes becomes a many-headed tune that summons people to contests. But more broadly, the aulos is also the most important instrument used for the musical accompaniment of Greek tragedy. You can think of the soundtrack accompanying the performance of Greek tragedy as an inherently monstrous lamentation. The loss of Medusa is what provokes this ongoing soundscape to a hugely significant part of ancient Greek aesthetics through the acoustic culture of Greek tragedy. We've discussed how Medusa's monstrous body in life and in death produces offspring, themselves a kind of hybrid collage of various species. Also sculpture via petrification, seascape architecture and sonic innovation. Both her body and her death produce and nourish art itself. Indeed, Medusa is an archetype of artistic fecundity. And despite the literary examples I have mentioned today, Medusa usually shows up in Greek and Latin literature 
in ekphrasis or metaphor at a remove from the action instead of as a character or interactive presence. Medusa seems to represent the dangerous power of art itself and the way in which art's capacity to represent horror, strangeness, hybridity, and power allows humans to make contact with that which is lethal and still live to tell the tale. As Jonas Grethlein has written, a reflection on pictorial seeing is encapsulated, if lying dormant, in any Gorgoneon. The beholder can face the depiction of something that would petrify her in nature. So it's fitting, therefore, that the exhibit Bodies in Crisis features various artistic depictions of Medusa's form. And I'll spend my last few minutes discussing these items on display in the Spurlock Museum. This slide features two objects on display in the exhibit, which are decorative appliques. Both are small. The first one is under seven centimeters in diameter, and the second is under four centimeters, and would likely have appeared on a large jar and a funeral shroud, respectively. They are geometrically circular with images of grimacing frontal gorgon gazes with teeth, tusks, and large glaring eyes or squinting eyes, surrounded by curly or serpentine hair. These objects are ancient Greek, dated to approximately 500 to 300 BC, ceramic and terracotta with quite faded pigment and gilding. It looks like blue pigment on the left and gold leaf on the right. And these appliques might have been placed on funeral monuments using the force of the Gorgon's gaze as an apotropaic or magical protective power that averts evil. Or they might have been worn on garments in a manner similar to how the goddess Athena places the head of the Gorgon on her own battle shawl, or her aegis, it's called, once Perseus is finished using the head as a weapon. And this Gorgon head on the aegis has the function of provoking terror in battle to anyone who encounters it. On this next slide, I have another diminutive or small representation of the Gorgon's gaze, which is a coin struck around the late fifth to the early fourth century BC in Greece. One side of this coin features a frontal grimacing Gorgon and the other depicts the face of a smiling young woman in profile. This is a Gorgon's face that can be touched and sort of fingered in the palm and used as currency. So that's a kind of different way of interacting with the Gorgon using her as currency. And on this last slide, uh, we have an image of a Larnax, which is a kind of coffin or sarcophagus for human remains or ashes that depicts another frontal Gorgon, this time with more expansive serpentine hair. So with these images now shown, I invite you in the audience and my interlocutors or anyone who's here to think through the function and effect of the Gorgon on these objects and think about how these mythic episodes invite us to ponder the function of these objects. Perhaps we might say that these art objects allow the person who commissioned them or wore them or made them to simultaneously play Medusa Perseus and Athena, because they allow the person to stake a claim to the supernatural power of the Gorgon gaze. Insofar as to create, use, or own any of these objects allows the user to shift between the different figures of monster, hero, and goddess. These objects themselves trouble the borders between these very categories. Just as the very idea of the monster mixes that which culture deems separate. I look forward to hearing your thoughts about these objects or discussing any aspects of the Medusa myth further with Adam and the audience. Thank you very much.